Welcome to Raccoon City. It's a meager Midwestern town with a population of little over 100,000. It exudes a bit of a blue collar vibe with small businesses on every other corner and uh, industrial factories all over its outskirts. The early morning hours sees the bustle of working class citizens making their daily commute with some traveling within the city and others taking the tram outside of it. The date is September 22nd, 1998. This is where it all began. This is the story of Resident Roleplay so far. Resident Evil Roleplay. The campaign begins in the small town of Raccoon City. The first character we meet is Emil Johansson, an army veteran and former medic. He arrives in search of his old military friend, Jack Carmine, who had mysteriously stopped responding to letters in recent weeks, causing concern among Emil and his ex-army comrades. Emil first checks into a room at the Apple Inn and begins his investigation in the suburbs, where he visits Jack's wife, Maria Carmine. She informs him that Jack had been missing for two weeks. She filed a report, but the police have made little progress as their attention is divided among the numerous missing persons cases from recent years. Maria mentions that Jack had been talking about a job opportunity with the Umbrella Corporation shortly before his disappearance. On the way out, Maria's neighbor stops Emil and points out that her friend Mike Foster is an RPD detective looking into the missing persons phenomenon. She suggests that he may be able to help. Emil spends the rest of the day chasing leads around the city. He ultimately decides to visit the police station to meet with Detective Mike Foster. Emil and Mike exchange information, but only one lead seems to arouse suspicion. Or she did mention something about a new job opportunity at job opportunity uh, at Umbrella. Umbrella's quite a big name in this city. I don't know if you know. Suggesting there. I'm aware of Umbrella. Yeah, it ain't a popular thought that they might be tied up in this somehow. But come to think of it, if there are any, I hate to imply this, cover-ups of any sort going on, they're really the only ones around here who can afford it. Everything else is small business. He kind of thinks about it for a second. He says, uh, uh, maybe that might be our, our, our line of approach. There is an inner city umbrella pharmaceutical center not too far from here. Say, I uh, check it out. Emil and Mike agree to join forces to investigate the Umbrella Pharmacy the next day. But for the evening, Mike heads back home to his apartment, where we're introduced to his kids. The second player character we meet is Arkea. She's a young schoolgirl and the adopted daughter of Mike Foster. We also meet Mike's son Brandon, who drives Arkea in Mike's car to their family friend Lena in the suburbs. Arkea has a heartfelt conversation with Lena in which she reveals more about her past. It turns out Arkea was born in an umbrella facility where she was raised by a researcher named Dr. Simmons. As the result of experimentation, she has a special condition in which she ages twice as fast, giving her the appearance of a 10-year-old despite having been born five years prior. However, her father figure Dr. Simmons was killed by umbrella security while helping Arkea to escape. Upon escape, she was found and adopted by a local cop named Steph, who was among those who had recently gone missing. After Steph's disappearance, her ex-husband Mike has raised Arkea ever since. After revealing all this information, Arkea expresses what is now her main concern. Um, I've been thinking a lot about where I come from, you know, who were my birth parents, why did they leave me, questions that I need to find the answers to. Too. Realizing they still have a school talent show to prepare for, Arkea and Brandon hurry home, where they find their father Mike waiting for his car by the curb. It turns out Mike is restless and eager to pursue these new leads as soon as possible. Arkea asks if she can tag along, which Mike consents to given that he doesn't expect any danger. Mike drives to the Apple Inn to pick up a meal, at which point two player characters meet for the first time. Uh, there's this, there's this there's little, little girl, girl. Just, little girl sitting back there. She puts, puts her hand on her shoulder and she says, she extends her other hand and she's like, Hi, I'm Arkea. 
the meal. <laughs> As they drive to the Umbrella Pharmacy, Arkea sits in the back of the car listening to some sort of cassette player that she keeps on hand. Meanwhile, in Umbrella's underground laboratory, we meet the third player character. Katara Oswald is a scientist and Umbrella researcher. With the outbreak in full swing in the labs, Katara is escorted by the USS agent James Grimson in order to retrieve her data. The two of them sneak past monsters and B.O.W.s on their way to the facility's offices, where Katara uses a flash drive to download her work. Afterwards, the two of them sneak back to the surface, narrowly avoiding the infected in the area. At the surface, Katara and Grimson return to the pharmacy, where they see Mike, Emil, and Arkea attempting to talk their way past the guards. Katara inquires about their business, to which Mike explains that they're looking for information from Umbrella's HR records regarding Jack Carmine. Katara, knowing some harmless records that they can look through, leads the party into a side office. After searching the records and finding nothing of interest, Mike pursues a more pertinent line of questioning, leading to the first natural one of the series and setting a chain of narrative events in motion. Now, I'm not meaning to imply anything, but does Umbrella happen to have any interests in the Arclay Mountain region? Uh, I do know that the Circular River begins as a series of streams up in the up in those mountains. Not that I know of. I'm gonna need you to make a deception check. <laughs> Please be good. <laughs> 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 that is a zero. Okay. We no, do not zero. have any assets in that in that area. Now I may just be some lowly detective, but make no mistake, I could move some papers around this town. So I'm gonna ask you one more time and expect you to answer straight. And at which point, uh, Grimson, who's been monitoring throughout this conversation, pulls Katara aside. He gives you this glare. He's just like. Now, what was that about arousing suspicion, I said? I'm just answering the questions and denying like I should. Yeah, you're doing a banged up job of that. If you would like to go through and answer these questions yourself, you can. I was here to collect data and leave. We gave them what they wanted. They came in. They looked. Nothing was found. They can leave now. No more questions. Yeah, but something tells me that detective's going to be on our back for a good deal after this. You know, come to think of it, this might be a little bit of an opportunity. Maybe we could kill two birds with one stone here. You, are you aware of the Arclay Cabin facility? And of course you would be aware at the of the situation um, at the, the cabin facility. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been suffering an outbreak and it contains a whole lot of uncollected research data uh, on local servers. You know, if you give these people a show, maybe guide them up to that cabin. At the very least, they could serve as cannon fodder for the infected while you retrieve that data. And if they die trying, then there'll be another problem off our back. Katara takes Grimson's recommendation and leads the party to the cabin in the Arklay Mountains. They park a short distance away and start walking up the trail. However, along the path they are ambushed by Cerberus, leading to the first combat encounter of the campaign. These undead dogs attack, nearly killing Mike. But with Emil's medical expertise, he manages to keep the detective alive. Hearing more Cerberus in the distance, the party makes a run for the cabin, killing a few dogs along the way, with Arkea getting the first how do you want to do this of the campaign. The group runs into the cabin and locks themselves inside for refuge. But this is only the beginning of the nightmare. Arkea, Emil, and Katara all make it inside the cabin safely. However, Mike Foster is nowhere to be found. Exploring the cabin, the party finds a corpse in the living room and also a wallet containing the ID of Jack Carmine. They soon run into our fourth player character, Chauncey Clancy, a former army soldier turned RPD detective and the partner of Mike Foster. It turns out Mike had called Chauncey to meet him at the cabin. Chauncey managed to arrive sooner than the others, but like the party that came after, he was chased indoors and trapped by the pack of Cerberus. The party spend some time getting acquainted to varying degrees of success. I'm gonna go over there and 
try to get a formal introduction. Grab her by the shoulder, spin her around. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> and who are you? Okay, we're gonna play this game. Uh, flip out the badge and say I asked first. <laughs> Congratulations, and I asked second. I'm currently looking for something right now. I have no care for who you are. Further searching the cabin, they go through a few rooms, finding some clues and documents revealing more about the cabin and the umbrella facility it houses. While exploring, the party hears a car crash outside, and looking out in the aftermath, they see Mike Foster run off into the woods after crashing his car into a tree, narrowly evading the dogs. Later on, the party finds a room with a double-barreled shotgun mounted to the wall. However, removing the shotgun from its hinges seems to activate mechanisms that close and lock the door. Meanwhile, Arkea enters the kitchen alone, where she encounters some sort of decayed human who slowly turns his head toward her, whom she then promptly attacks with her baseball bat. This leads to a fight with the first zombie of the campaign. However, having taken the shotgun, the rest of the party remains trapped in the other room. Emil pulls on the hinges with his hands, allowing Chauncey and Katara to escape with the shotgun. Katara holds the door, giving Emil a chance to dash outside, but the mechanisms force it closed too quickly and he ends up ramming into the door, hurting himself and remaining trapped. The others go to fight the zombies in the kitchen, and after some effort, Arkea delivers the finishing blow with her bat. Exploring the rest of the grounds, the party finds a fenced-off backyard with a tool shed and a locked cellar door. After some searching, they find the items they need to unlock a secret compartment in the living room which contains a key to the master bedroom on the second floor. In that room, they find a zombie that's not like the other. This one has red skin and claws. This one is a crimson head. Knowing from the documents that this is the site manager who possesses a key that they need, the party battles this crimson head. Another zombie comes out of the bathroom to join the fight. Arkea waits outside to trip the zombie as it comes through, but mistakes Katara for it and inadvertently trips her instead. Chauncey takes fatal wounds from the Crimson Head's claws and goes down. It's looking grim, but Emil heals him with herbs, just in time for him to finish the Crimson Head off by taking a stylish shot. Okay, I'm definitely gonna go Globetrotters, and I'm just like underneath the leg, and a uh, POW! <laughs> <laughs> With their newfound key, the ragtag band of survivors take out the last remaining zombie and make their way into the cabin's basement, where they are stopped by a reinforced security door with a biometric lock. Searching the basement, they find documents giving them more information about the facility, one of which is assigned by James Grimson, the USS agent that had accompanied Katara when the party first met her at the pharmacy. One of the documents also makes mention of something called Project Samson, Tension and suspicion begins to build. Crimson was the was the security guy back at the, the pharmacy that we went to first. He was with Katara. He knows about this place, so I can assume she knows about this place. Maybe I'll just have to go and ask her and find out. Oh boy. She definitely is not letting us in on something. To bypass the biometric lock, the survivors continue searching the grounds and find a hidden entrance to an abandoned mine under the tool shed. Venturing into the mine, they fight their way past another few zombies before Arkea reveals some new information about her past. Uh, she uh, opens the locket and says, you know that project you keep talking about? Samson. Samson. Well, <laughs> funny thing, is she points to the guy in the picture. She says, his surname is Samson. That's just a coincidence. That this it's a common name. The guy in the uh, in that one story from the Bible is also named Samson. Oh. Am I supposed to believe he's a part of this? To solidify this connection, Arkea also plays one of the tapes from her tape recorder for all to hear. My head is spinning, and my world is being turned upside down for the third time in my life. I met this blonde man that I could only assume was Wesker, the big boss man himself, Yuko's father. He told me that my time at the facility had come to an end. While the idea of leaving this place was my end goal, I didn't want to leave without Yuko at my side, with us together seeing the world. 
When Aiden returned to the cell, he looked dazed and overwhelmed. He just rushed to me, and the sound of combat boots hitting the floor was the only sound in the small built cage. I wanted to ask him what was wrong, but as I pulled away, he only pulled me closer to him. He begged me not to let go, and I wasn't about to. I just wanted to know what happened. When I asked him what was wrong, I wish I had it. He told me that he was leaving, that a man that I knew from the description was my father. I told him that he had outgrew the program. My blood started to boil and my nose started to bleed. I was that angry. Although Aiden just brought me close and kissed me deeply and after we pulled away, he just held me close. I'm sorry. I must go now. It's not enough, Aiden. We need more time. If it were up to me, I would take you with me. But I can't. I'm sorry. I I love love you, Aiden. Realizing that Archaea is far more involved than they knew, more discussion is prompted, and more of her family tree is uncovered. Tell me whatever you know about that blonde man. Well, I can start off and say that Wesker is dead. Well, as you guessed, by listening to that, of course, uh, that, that's my grandfather. But more importantly, I just saw him four months ago. He's dead now. How? There was, uh, an incident that happened at another location. Uh, he happened to die there. Damn it! He's the only one that can answer the questions that I have. Further down the tunnels, they navigate some hazardous environments before arriving in a chamber where they find the severed hand of a senior security officer. However, on their way out, they are ambushed by a group of spider B.O.W.s, known as web spinners. Using a flash grenade they picked up before, they make short work of these enemies before making their way back to the surface. On their way out of the mines, the survivors run into an injured Mike Foster in the cabin's backyard. Now armed with a shotgun, he accuses Katara of intentionally leading them into danger. Mike makes threats against her life, but the party ultimately comes to Katara's protection. Chauncey then rends the shotgun from Mike's back and manages to talk him down. Uh, I'm being serious now. We really need to calm this situation down. Nobody's hurt anybody in this group. We're not going to point guns at each other anymore from this point forward. Do I make myself clear? Chauncey, make an intimidation check with advantage. Ah! Oh, that's one. <laughs> the party then heads back into the cabin and sleeps through the night. Throughout the rest, Hamil and Katara take some time to dissect some of the zombies and learn more about their biology, while some of the others make conversation. During a talk with Mike, Archaea plays yet another cassette tape for all to hear. It had been a few months since Yuko moved in the cell with me. When we found out that we wouldn't kill each other, she started to open up to me. I discovered that she was the boss's daughter. She told me that when she was young, her father had her mother killed, and she was taken and brought here. I almost felt bad for her. Well, no, that wasn't true. I I did feel bad for her. Six months is how long we had been living together. We watched each other bleed, fight, and cry, although life was hard on both of us most of the time. We did have our good times but they were few and far between. There was something about Aiden that made my heart skip a beat whenever we spent time together. I was walking back to the cage that we lived in with a guard at my side. When I got there, what I saw broke my heart. Aiden, he was laying on the floor beaten and bloody. Everything hurt. I don't know what I ever did to them to deserve this. When I heard footsteps in the hall, I knew that Yuka was on her way back from training. I couldn't let her see me like this, but I really couldn't move either. My body felt like it was on fire. When I saw her being shoved in by the guard, my blood started to boil. The slam of the gate was followed by a deathly silence. If I wouldn't have been able to focus on that pretty face of hers, 
I wouldn't have been able to tell she was even in the cell with me. I forced my legs to move forward. That small cage never seemed so big. I thought I would never reach his side. When I did, I kneeled down and looked at him with tears in my eyes. I pulled his head into my lap and for the first time told him that I loved him. I struggled to hold still after that. What had I just started? When I heard her tell me that she loved me, my heart skipped a couple of beats and my cheeks started to turn red. I think that I felt the same way she did. So after a few moments, I opened my mouth to speak the words that she needed to hear and that I longed to say. I told her I loved her too. The next morning, the survivors make their way through the reinforced security door in the basement, which leads them into a room with an elevator that takes them even deeper, underground. On these lower levels, they discover offices and laboratories in which the Umbrella Corporation conducted bioweapons experiments. Among many files, they also find a cassette tape labeled Dr. Simmons' Log. When I entered her cell with the guards, I wanted to turn around and run. I knew that I did this to her in a way. It may have been her father's idea for a better future, but I executed his plan, which made me just as guilty. As I watched her, the guilt only grew. She had just turned 18 years old, and now she was just becoming a parent, and the father wasn't even able to be there. I knew Aiden while he was here. The boy may have been an emotional mess, but I still think that he had the right to know that he fathered a child that was soon to be born. What have we done? We used this poor girl. We really are monsters. It seems that Dr. Simmons, the scientist that served as Arkea's caretaker in her early years, had once resided at this location. They also find a number of other documents, including a journal belonging to Albert Wesker, which reveals much about Arkea's family history. This, though, is not shared with Arkea. They also find a researcher's journal which reveals that this facility began tyrant research years prior. After restoring power to the facility, the party is ambushed by a massive spider creature which had coated the laboratory in tough webbing. With an immediate critical hit, Emil has a close brush with death, but the survivors eventually triumph over the monster and make their way into the armory. Inside they find powerful new weapons and gear, including a fancy custom M1911, which Chauncey quickly claims as his own. However, there are three names inscribed in the slide, Emil Johansson, Edward Lopez, and Scott Moeller. Recognizing this weapon, Emil, with a natural 20, punches Chauncey in the face to take it back, and goes on to explain its significance. I, I hold the gun up to him and I point to the slide. This was, this is Jack's gun. This is the gun of the man that I'm looking for. And you're not going to get this gun from me, nor are you going to fire it. With their new weapons in hand, including Chauncey with a semi-automatic shotgun and Katara with a newfound grenade launcher, the party makes their way even deeper into the labs. With the power restored and the party freshly armed, the survivors make their way back to the labs and take an elevator to an even lower floor. They exit to a prison area with many cells. While clearing the Chamber of Zombies, they are also attacked by a pack of reptilian B.O.W.s called Hunters. Realizing they are outmatched, they each hide inside a cell and wait for the Hunters to retreat. Afterwards, they explore the area and find a chamber used for bioweapons testing. In an adjoining room, they also find a cassette tape. Looking around, Arkea soon realizes that this is, in fact, the place in which she, and therefore also her parents, grew up. Meanwhile, Mike pulls Chauncey aside as they discuss the newly discovered depths of this Umbrella conspiracy and make plans to corner Katara. As the tension builds, Chauncey brings the tape to have it played 
with Arkea's cassette player in front of the group. Arkea allows Mike to handle the player, which he has some trouble with before finally playing its contents. He pops it into the tape player, uh, kind of fumbles around with it a little bit. He's... How do you use these? Yeah, how do you... This new fangled technology. He just got out. Right, press the button, yeah, and when it opens... No, 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 I got it. I got it. I got it. I think I got it. You got it in backwards. No, no. Oh, no. You might be right. Hold on. All right. Let's start from the beginning. All right. I'm going to try. I'm going to do that. I'm going to put it in that way. And oh, all right, I think it just clicked. Shut. I think we might be good. I think we might be good. All right. I press play. It's the, it's the triangle. No, yeah, uh, not, not, the, not the two two bars, the the triangle. I, not, not the square. Right next to it. This is the triangle. Ah, oh, man. Okay. I think I figured it out. Let's give this here a listen. I was on what we like to call the field. It wasn't really a field, but that's what Aiden liked to call it. It was the place we fought. It was lonely there without him. I was fighting some screwed up monster. It was easy, but that really wasn't the point. Where Aiden normally stood, there was nothing but empty space. Once the thing laid lifeless at my feet, I looked up at the surveillance window. I wanted to go back to my cell. Rather his cell. They never moved me from Aiden's cell. Maybe they did it because they knew I loved him, or as a sick joke, I could really care less. I just wanted the heart inside my chest to stop beating. Without Aiden, there was no point living in this trapped life. I heard the buzzing of the door unlock, and my father walked in, and I knew I was in for a fight. I just want to go back to the cage. Can you please let me go? Lose the tone, you go. You took everything from me. My mother and the only light I had left. Oh, you're upset because we transferred Aiden. That was left up to the two of you. You were never supposed to fall in love. Love? What in the hell do you know about love? <laughs> 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 Who are you to tell me what I know? Like it or not, you are still my daughter. You will respect me. Listen, you stopped being my father the day you promised me that you'd get me my favorite cake for my birthday, and then you walked out of my life forever. Listen, little girl. Someday you will learn that everything I did, I did for you. And you will be grateful for that. I will never be grateful for what you have done to me. After hearing the recording, Mike and Chauncey make their move and confront Katara. They hold shut the cell in which she rests and perform a good cop, bad cop routine, with Chauncey as the bad cop. Katara deflects their aggressive questioning, which eventually dissolves into a shouting match that Arkea and Emil have to break up. In the aftermath, Arkea reveals her history with this facility and proves it by playing another tape. My name is Arkea Sampson. I was born in an umbrella facility, never knew who my birth parents were. As far as I knew, my adoptive father, Dr. Simmons, gave me the name Arkea. Where Samson came from, I had no idea. I never called him Dr. Simmons, but I never called him Daddy either. I called him Rafi. Rafi told me I was just special and had set me aside from the other kids. What he meant by that was, I was older than what time would say. For example, I had been on the earth for five years, but I looked ten and my brain was that of someone of fifteen years. Umbrella gave me everything I needed because they saw me as an asset. I had to have braces and glasses, so I got them. I wanted to learn, so they hired me a private tutor. Rafi took really good care of me, but the one thing I wanted to know, they would not tell me. And that was what happened to my birth parents. I had to come from somewhere, right? As I saw the little shadow standing only outside my door, I knew that Arkea was standing there, thinking the worst. I got up from my desk and walked across the room, and leaning on the doorframe I saw Arkea. She was sitting on the floor, with her knees pulled up to her chest, and a sad look about her face. I knelt down and placed a hand on her shoulder. 
I patted her back and told her of her birth parents, that they were still alive, and then I handed her a picture of her mother and her together shortly after she was born. She was shocked, and she just shook and held tightly onto my lab coat and the picture. Once I stopped shaking and looked up at him, he asked me if I wanted to go find them. He said he would risk his own life to help me. I was about to nod my head when alarms started to go off and gunfire started in the distance. Before I knew it, he was on his feet yelling at me to get up and to follow him with haste. As I ran, my heart was in my stomach. I knew something bad was going to happen, and there was nothing I could do about it. We made it outside, and the sun almost stung at my eyes. I don't think I've ever seen the sun. I was only drawn away by the sound of gunfire, followed by gasping. I didn't even want to look down from the bright light that engulfed me, but I had to. Raffi was laying face down on the ground in front of me. Tears started falling down my face as I fell to my knees. I didn't even notice the two agents making their way towards me. As I was trying to fight my way out of their grip, I saw one of their badges and I swore at Red Samson. Could this be my father? I screamed and cried as they drug me to the blonde man that had just shot down the only father I had ever known. The other man pushed me on my knees and lifted my head back. I could see the other man who I thought was my father wince as the blonde haired man lifted my chin and smiled. Arkea also shows Mike to the cell that she once called her own. With this revelation, Mike implores her to act as a witness against Umbrella. But Arkea is hesitant, and Katara justifies this fear, explaining that Umbrella has the resources to hunt them down. Following these confrontations, Arkea finds a unique cell, the only one with bunk beds. Within that cell, she finds yet another cassette tape. So today, I was told that I was getting a new cellmate. There was no rhyme or reason to it. I had been alone for five years. Why did they think I need someone now? Wait, maybe it wasn't because I need someone. Maybe they were going to kill me, or I was going to kill them. Was I about to be used as combat data? I did not know. I also wondered if this person was as nervous as I was. Why? Why was my only question. I've been alone in the same cell since I got here five years ago. Now I'm being thrown in with someone else, and they expect me to be okay with this? I think not. They came to get me from the mess hall for my lunch and told me to follow them to my new home. I just rolled my eyes, dumped my tray, and followed. When the cell door opened, I turned around to meet my new roommate. She was a girl. She looked younger than me and not much of a threat. The way she carried herself was that of a very angry and scared person. I walked over to her and shook her hand. I told her my name was Aiden and kindly asked for hers. When I seen the person I was to live with, I coughed to hide my shock. He was tall and handsome. I stiffened and tried to pretend that I was tough. When he came over to shake my hand, I shook his softly, and the tough facade I had going dropped when he asked me what my name was. I told him it was Yuko as we shook hands. The party then reconvenes and continues exploring the labyrinthine facility. After fighting their way past some stray infected and BOWs, as well as solving some puzzles to find more medallions, they eventually come across a surviving scientist named Dr. Quincy. He's holding up what looks to be some sort of spray canister with a lighter in front of it. He's like, ah, back! Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it! And Katara is gonna like pop in and be like, whoa, whoa! I'm pointing my gun at him. Oh, Put it down! It's okay! Put it down! Are you Put people real? Yes, no, of course they're not real. <laughs> I'm here. And he sees kind of Archaea as you kind of stepped forward and said a few words. And he sees Hi. you and he's like, oh, now I must be hallucinating. Uh, Archaea. Well, look who's yeah, it's me. come <laughs> home after all this time. Um, Just rah. couldn't stay away, could you? Although crazed and on edge from spending about a week underground, Chauncey and Emil eventually wrestle Dr. Quincy to the ground and disarm him. 
After Arkea violently interrogates Dr. Quincy for more information about her parents, the party holds her back and takes the scientist as their guide to the lower floors on the promise of an emergency escape route. On their way back to the elevator, they find the zombies they'd killed earlier transformed into Crimson Heads, which then rush them as they narrowly manage to close the elevator doors in time. On the lower levels, Chauncey finds and retrieves a T-Virus sample from cold storage, though he is oblivious as to what exactly it is. Meanwhile, Katara downloads the facility's research data from the server room, accomplishing the objective Umbrella originally sent her for. Finally, the group uses the medallions they'd gathered to unlock and enter the special project's room, where Emil discovers the fate of his old army friend, Jack Carmine. But what catches all of your eyes the most as you enter in is on the far opposite side of the room in the center, there's a large metal-backed glass cylinder. Inside it, suspended in a clear liquid, is what looks to be some sort of nine-foot-tall figure. It appears oh, to be a no. man. He's nude and has no hair anywhere on his body. Pale white skin, toned musculature like that of an Olympic athlete. But most notably, his most notable feature is that its heart is beating on the outside of its chest and has a large claw-like protrusion on its right arm. It's grotesque and synthetic looking, and Dr. Quincy <clears throat> just sort of bows in front of it with his arms presenting it like something magnificent. He says, I give you, good sir, the object of your search. Oh my Eyeballing God. Emil. Under, to the right of the cylinder, you notice, Emil, uh, a monitor that catches your eye. Uh -huh. It has uh, displayed in text on it uh, just the information about the subject being stored. It reads T-005, Project Tyrant, Subject Jack Carmine, Status Stable. In order to escape, Dr. Quincy releases the emergency exit lock by activating the facility's self-destruct system. In a sudden but inevitable betrayal, he also releases the Tyrant from storage and tries to blind the party with a chemical flash and make a break for the exit alone. But he doesn't get far before Chauncey guns him down. However, it is too late and the party now must face the wrath of the Tyrant. The battle is intense, the Tyrant impales Mike with its claw and throws him at Arkea. Emil attempts to sacrifice himself so that the party may escape. Not willing to leave any man behind, Chauncey doubles back for him. And in the end, Emil delivers the finishing blow with a shot from Jack Carmine's own firearm. Uh, Emil, how do you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> you killed it! You killed it! Yes! What? Oh my god, what? dude. I was ready what? to- I was about to go. <laughs> Just turn it off, buddy! Or what? Maria would have hated to see you like this! Boom, right through the heart. Uh, yeah, bullet flies, almost in slow motion, bullet time, through the air, creating a spiral trail as it streaks across the room, past oh Chauncey, sinking into its heart. A big splatter of blood comes out as it reels, stumbles, drops to one knee, and then falls. With the tyrant down, Chauncey drags Mike's body, and the survivors race against the clock as the self-destruct timer counts down. They take an emergency exit to a train car that leads them speeding away from the facility as it detonates behind them. Now, free from the nightmare, they take a moment to breathe. But this relief is short-lived, as they discover that the tyrant not only survived, but had clung to the top of their train car and arrived with them at their destination miles away. Noticing a rocket launcher mounted to a nearby wall in this underground station, Chauncey makes a run for it as the party covers him. Using the rocket launcher, he obliterates the tyrant that was once Jack Carmine, ending the threat once and for all. And he Burn in hell, you son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wave my mullet around. In the aftermath, Emil says a prayer for his fallen comrade. Katara stays a moment, contemplating what she is a part of. Then together, the party ascends via elevator back to the surface. And that concludes the story of the Arclay Cabin.